Y'all ready to get into it? All right, we've been in a series called, What Do You Believe? What Do You Believe? And today I want to talk about an aspect of the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, if you've been in church, I don't know, a week you should have heard about the gospel. Why in the world would a church at the maturity level of this one need to talk about directly the gospel? Because we all understand the gospel, right? We have sinned. Jesus paid for our sins with his death on a cross. We accept that payment for us and we are saved from an eternal hell. We are saved to an eternity with God. It is simple, right? Yes and no. And no. So first, let's talk about the gospel that most people know. And the, and the most concise, if you're ever wondering, where's the best place in the Bible to go to just hear a gospel presentation? It is Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, verse 1. I want you to hear this out in scope of the gospel presentation. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you formerly walked according to this world, according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Remember that word, disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. We were indulging the desires of the flesh and of the man mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him. He seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that one would boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So here we go. Let's talk about the components of the gospel and how we got to a place where we needed the gospel. God tells Adam, do not eat from this tree that's in the garden or you're going to die. So let's look at that. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded the man, that would be Adam, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Adam and Eve ate from the tree, they fell to the ground dead, and there is no man and humankind left on the earth. Not true. Not true, but God said they were going to die. So why did they not die? Because we are made in the image of God in three parts, in a triune being. We are body, we are soul, we are spirit. Go to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. The whole of a man is his body, soul, and spirit. So Adam and Eve's bodies did not die in the garden when they disobeyed God. Adam and Eve's soul did not die in the garden. They still had thoughts. As a matter of fact, they hid and said, we're ashamed. But Adam and Eve's spirit died. Now, stay with me. Not death like we know it, but a separation from God. The spirit died in a separate... What happened? Man was given over to death because man gave himself over to Satan. He began following and listening to Satan. Death in Scripture is not talking about our bodies. It's talking about an eternal separation from God who is life. Are you with me? I hope you are. Man is eternally separated from God when he chooses to follow Satan. Man is eternally separated from God when he leaves the kingdom of God and enters the domain of darkness where Satan rules. You want to see it in scripture? It's in John 5, 24. Truly I say to you, Jesus talking, he who hears my word and believes him, God who sent me, Jesus, has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but he has passed out of death into life. 
So man stays in that eternal death and darkness unless he passes out of it into life. So what is Paul talking about here in Ephesians when he explains it this way? You were dead in your trespasses and sin. He is speaking to alive people. They're breathing in front of him, listening to him talk. But he's saying you were dead in which you formerly walked in the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the son's obedience. That is a, a sermon in itself, but we're talking about Satan. We're talking about the fact that you're walking according to the prince of this world, Satan. Satan is not a king, but he does have rulership in this domain because man had it and gave it to Satan. So they're walking as sons of disobedience, following Satan, not God. Verse 3. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. We were indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So if you've heard, if you've been at Revive very many weeks at all, you have heard me say, you will spend an eternity with whoever you are following. You will spend an eternity with whoever you are submitted to. You will spend an eternity with whoever you are obeying. And man chose to obey Satan instead of obey God. So man was dead in darkness following what Satan said to do. Ephesians 2, 4, 7. 4 starts this way. But God. Everybody say, but God. But God, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us that even when we were dead in our transgressions made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him raised us up from where from death into life you have been raised out of death into life, seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace. In the ages to come, after you leave the kingdom of darkness and you enter the kingdom of light, God is then going to show you his surpassing riches. Oh, you're going to get it in a minute, I promise you. He's made us alive, seated us with him. Because of Jesus, we get to leave death and darkness and come into light and life. John 8, 12. And Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. You will not walk in death if you're following me. You will be following the light of life. You've left darkness, now you're following the light of life. So to have light and life, you have to leave death and darkness. And God makes a way for us to do that. Colossians 1.13 For he, God, rescued us from the domain of darkness. That's where Satan rules. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and he transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. Some of you don't even know what happened to you. You got taken out of death and darkness. You got transferred into a kingdom of Jesus. It's Jesus' kingdom. You left Satan's domain and entered Jesus' kingdom. How does that happen? 2 Corinthians 5.21 He, God, made him Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. How many of you have a parent? That's awesome, all but four. Okay. Your parents understood discipline. When you disobeyed, there had to be a consequence. There had to be a discipline. In, in, in harsh terms, there had to be a condemnation or a punishment. There had to be some consequence for disobedience. 
your and I consequence for disobedience is that we are taken out of the kingdom of light and put into the kingdom of darkness because of our sin. And I became dead in my sin. But God made Jesus who knew no sin. Therefore, he was not in the kingdom of darkness. He was in the kingdom of light. But he made him to be sin so that I might become right with him. What just happened? I'm over here in darkness. Jesus is over here in light. Jesus says, I will go into darkness in order to transfer you out and put you in the kingdom of light. So here is Jesus taking on that separation from God for us. Remember, death is separation from God. You remember on the cross, Jesus says, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because what's happening is he's become sin on our behalf. And God has turned him over to the kingdom of darkness. <laughs> but, but there's a Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit raises Jesus out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So in dying for us, Jesus made you and I righteous. What does it mean to be righteous? If your child is righteous before you, they have right standing with you. There is no need for a punishment or a condemnation or a consequence because they are in right standing. They have righteousness. So he made me right before God. In other words, God no longer sees my sinful action because Jesus paid for it in his separation and death. And now I am not due a consequence or a punishment or a separation from God. Are you with me? This is good news. Why do I give you that information up front when we're talking about the kingdom of God? Because I want you to listen really, really close to me. If you believe that that is all there is to the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you will sit back and wait knowing you have a ticket to eternity with God. Oh, listen to me. You will wait for Jesus to address the sin in the world, and you will have faith in him coming back to fix everything that's wrong. So my job is to wait for his return since I'm in his kingdom. Oh, buckle up. <laughs> buckle up, because we're going to go to Romans chapter 5, verse 17. I want you to hear this. Yes, you have been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Now watch. 517, for if by the transgression of the one, talking about the sin of Adam, death reigned through the one, we all entered sin in the kingdom of darkness following Satan, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. What did Christ do? He gave me righteousness before God. We just read that. We have a gift of righteousness. So let's put it together. Romans 5, 17. For if by the transgression of the one Adam, death reigning in darkness through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. That's what we're going to talk about today. Because those who became righteous, they left death, they were transferred into the kingdom of Jesus, and now it says they will reign in life. Hold on, because we're going there. That word reign, in the Greek, as it's used in this verse, basiloo, basiloo, it means to exercise kingly power. Stay with me. Jesus is the king. We get to reign in life. Therefore, we get to exercise the king's power. 
Romans 5 says those who have been transferred into the kingdom of Christ, those who have been made righteous before God, now reign with Christ. But reigning means to exercise a kingly power. I am not the king. Jesus is the king. But the king has a power that I get to exercise. You see, here's the problem with the gospel in the global church today. I'm talking to U.S., I'm talking all around the world. Here's the problem with the gospel that we're presenting. If you see the gospel as the hope of Jesus returning, then you are looking for a rescue. But if the gospel is the opportunity to reign in life, you should be demonstrating the power of the king. And so I know I can see it on some of the faces. Oh, he's one of those pastors. He's one of those glory-seeking, let's make a show out of everything pastor. I want to show you in Scripture how great men of faith understood this concept of exercising the king's power. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he, God, said to me, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ might dwell in me. He says, I realize it's not my power, it's his power, but I'm humbled to get to demonstrate the king's power. Let's keep going. Peter shows it to us in Acts chapter 4. Here's what's happening in Acts chapter 4. Peter has taken a man who is lame and he can now walk. He is now walking through the power that Peter exercised. The man is walking and the Pharisee rulers are saying, how did you do this? I think it was Satan. Can't be of God. You did it on the wrong. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we're on trial today for the benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, then let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel, but by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands before you in good health. <laughs> Peter had demonstrated the power of the king to heal this man. But Peter said, I'm not doing this. Jesus is doing this. Let's keep going. 1 Corinthians 2, 5. We're talking about Paul again. Verse 1. And when I came to you, brethren, I didn't come to you with superiority of speech or wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except... Jesus Christ and him crucified. What's he saying? I just came to share the gospel. Not to be eloquent in speech. Not to give you some amazing wisdom. Just to tell you the gospel. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom. But my preaching was in the demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of a man teaching you but your faith would rest on the power that God has Paul straight up says I came to you to demonstrate the power of God I came in weakness to demonstrate his power why so that you would not base your faith on your ability to analyze the situation and the story and say, is it valid? And can I put my faith in that? And can I trust it? No, what he said, you couldn't walk. Now you can walk. Do you believe in the power of God? Yeah. He's demonstrating it. What an honor. What an honor it is for a believer to realize that I get to demonstrate the power of God so that you would put your faith in Him. Listen, when we figure this out, it will release a power that we have always wanted to demonstrate. 
Maybe when the ego gets checked and we recognize who's at work, then we can give him the freedom to work. Because we're going to do it for his glory, not for our glory. Oh, I could say things I don't want to say. Okay. We can only reign through the power of Jesus Christ. We have no right to exercise power without Christ. We have no right to reign without his power. We have no power to demonstrate greater than a person who is in the kingdom of darkness without Christ. Oh, you got to chew on that for a minute, don't you? 1 Corinthians 2.14. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. A natural man does not have the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, that power, for their foolishness to him. You guys think you can do miracles? This is ridiculous. And he can't understand them. How in the world do you think you could heal another man without medicine? Why? Because they're spiritually appraised. We're talking about something that's going on in the spirit. We're not talking about something that's going on in the physical. Oh my. We as believers understand where the power we demonstrate is coming from. And an unsaved person cannot demonstrate the power of God. An unsaved person cannot demonstrate the power of God. Why? You're not in the kingdom of Christ. The saved person, listen to me, is obligated to demonstrate the power of God so that the lost will put their faith in God. Is that not what Paul was saying? Listen to me. The saved person is obligated to demonstrate the power of God so that the lost person can put their faith in God. Paul says this in Romans 15, 18. For I'll not presume to speak of anything else except what Christ has accomplished through me. I'm not going to talk about anything else except what Christ did through me. Resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed. The Gentiles came to faith because Christ's power was working in me. In the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and around about as far as Illyricum, that's it, Illyricum, everybody say Illyricum so you can get over it. I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Did you see what he just did? He connected the gospel of Christ with power, signs, and wonders. Did you see it? He said, I went and shared the gospel in power of signs, wonders, and power of the Spirit. So, we're not going to cover everything there is in the kingdom. This, mor oh. <laughs> this morning, I just want to talk about our right to reign. Our right to exercise the power of the king. So what are the, some of the ways that we can demonstrate the power of Jesus our king? Let's go back and see how he demonstrated his power. And then he told us to use his power to reign. Matthew 4, 14. And when he went ashore, he, Jesus, he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them. And he healed their sick. Healing the sick is a way to demonstrate Christ's power. Luke 13, 11 through 12. And there's a woman for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit. Notice it's not capital S, it's lower S. Caused by an evil spirit. And she was bent double, bent over, and could not straighten up at all. And when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. He cast the demon out of her. He healed her joint problem. <laughs> Luke 8, 43 and 44. And a woman who had a, had a hemorrhage for 12 years and could not be healed by anyone came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. That says part of Christ's power is healing issues in the blood and issues of reproduction. Matthew 8, 5 through 7. 
And when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearful and tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Healing from paralyzation and deliverance from fear and torment are part of the power of Christ. Just a couple more. Luke 9. And he called the 12 together and he gave them power and authority over all of the demons. How many of the demons? Oh, all of the demons. Authority over all the demons. Even the strong man? Yeah, even the strong man. Authority over all demons and to heal diseases. So deliverance from demonic oppression is part of his power. Matthew 11, 4, 5. Jesus answered and said to them, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. And the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. Eyes, ears, disease, life. These are some of the demonstrations of the power of our king. And this same king, you can clap for that. Go ahead. This same king says, you are to reign with me. You are to exercise kingly power with me. We're going to do something different this morning. I would like all of my altar ministers, my elders and their wives, Alan, Angie, Bird, I'd like you to come up front, please. I just want you to stand right here. Not closing the service yet, just bear with me. Because I believe this morning there are two reasons why you are not demonstrating the power of the king, why you are not exercising the kingly power, why you are not reigning in life. One, you don't believe that salvation comes with the power of the king. And hopefully I've just explained that to you, that we were told we are to reign with Christ and to reign means to exercise that kingly power. Our number two, you're not saved. You're still in the kingdom of darkness and we're going to deal with you in just a minute. <clears throat> but before we do that, I want to demonstrate the king's power. If you are here this morning and you are suffering from any kind of joint pain, I want you to stand up. If you're suffering from any kind of repetitive headaches, I want you to stand up. If you have sciatica nerve problems, if you have any kind of vision or hearing problems, if you have any kind of blood issue or reproductive issue, any type of back injury, ooh, here's what we're going to do. These people right here, it's going to take a few minutes, so y'all think about your lunch later. You think about it now, you're going to get hungry. Don't think about it yet. I'm going to send them out, and they're going to begin praying for you. They're going to lay hands on you and ask God to take that pain away, to fix that joint, to straighten you out, to heal you of that. Go, go, team, go. Just start praying. Go out, just pray. Touch somebody, pray over them, heal them. Now listen, when they come to you, just tell them what the issue is. Don't give them the history. Don't tell them, well, when I was four years old, we were in a car wreck. Don't need to know that. You're going to say back pain. You're going to say blood issue. You're going to say neck hurts. You're going to say sciatica problem. That's all we need. That's all we need. Just so we can focus our prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, this morning, we reign in life and exercise Christ Jesus' power over these bodies. We command in the name of Jesus for pain to leave right now. I rebuke you, pain, and I command you to leave that body in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, that assignment of the enemy against your body is right now canceled in Jesus' name. I speak to that demonic force and I say you are bound and you are cast out. You can no longer torment in Jesus' name. Quickly, ministers, quickly, person to person. We got a lot of ground to cover. In the name of Jesus, we declare that we are children of the living God full of light 
and life. And Jesus heals in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, that spirit of infirmity, let go, release, be gone right now. Listen, you can lift your hands and receive this from me this morning. In the name of Jesus, we accept your healing, Jesus. We don't resist. We let go of doubt. We say, right now, I will be healed. Right now, the power of Jesus Christ is moving in this room. Come on, altar ministers, keep moving. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we receive the healing. Right now, I rebuke pain and command it to leave your body. That sciatic nerve, that swelling, all of that will go right back into place, into alignment. Your back, your shoulders in alignment. In Jesus' name, all inflammation and swelling is to leave now in Jesus' name. We are receiving the healing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, deaf ears open. Deaf ears open right now in Jesus' name. Blind eyes be healed right now. We're calling out 2020 right now. Bring it out. If scales fall off your eyes, catch them. Hold on to them. I want to see them. In Jesus' name, we just receive the power of our Savior to heal. Heal us, Lord. Touch us, Lord. Move, Holy Spirit, in this place. Move in this place and heal. Touch them, Lord. Touch them. Heal them right now. Right now, in Jesus' name, we just command healing in this room. I speak to that back that's out of a line, that constantly keeps you from sleeping, that brings you pain, and I say straighten up right now, in alignment, straight, all swelling gone, all disc in alignment, all nerve and blood flow where it's supposed to be, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I call for lungs to absorb oxygen clearly and cleanly right now in Jesus' name. We got a few more over here if my ministers can keep moving. Hang on, guys. We're about 70% of the way there. In the name of Jesus, we just declare your body made whole. Your body made whole. Your body made whole right now. That headache has got to go. Whatever's causing that, whatever pressure, whatever imbalance, we fix it right now. We say come into alignment with the Word of God. That by His stripes we were healed. The only lamb beaten before sacrifice. Why? So that your body could be healed. So that the lamb took the scourging. The lamb took the physical infirmity for you. In Jesus' name, we just command it and we declare it. You are made whole today. Receive what he has for you today. All right, we're going to take an intermission. You guys keep praying. But if you're here today and we just prayed for you and you believe that pain is gone and you've been healed, I just want you to stand up and wave both your arms. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, come on. All right, altar minister, you guys can be seated. Altar minister, we have a large group right over here. If we can get that taken care of, a little group over here, a little group back there. Let's finish this up because we're going to lay hands on everybody that is in pain and get you healed today praise God praise God listen not of us the power of the kingdom of Jesus Christ in your body healing you taking away that pain that is God loving on you that is Jesus Christ showing his love for you at the cross taking that pain from you we don't live in pain We have a king who heals. Jesus' name. We're close. Everybody hang with me just a minute. Don't deny somebody else the opportunity to get healed. 
Come on, take that pain away right now in Jesus' name. We rebuke that pain. Get out, get out, get out. If that demonic spirit is oppressing you in Jesus' name, I command it to stop, to cease and desist, to be bound and to be cast out. He gave us authority over all of the demons, over all of the demons. So right now, if you're in this room and you are a part of the demonic host, leave, go now, get out in Jesus' name. All right, um, you guys, right back here, there's still a few people standing over here. You guys, by the way, that's Henry and Sandy. I call my closest friend guys, buddy, and girl. So if you see me, say, hey, girl. It's not because I don't know your name. It's because we're close. All right, we're almost there. We're almost there. Almost there. Got maybe a half a dozen dozen left here. Come on, we are receiving it this morning, Jesus. We are receiving your healing this morning. We will not walk in doubt. We will walk in faith. We will know it's your desire that all of us be made whole, that all of us be healed. None of us are taking our illness as a punishment. You have already taken the punishment. We are healed in Jesus' name. We are healed in Jesus' name. Very close, very close. Very close. All right, gotcha, gotcha. All right, I think we got everybody covered. All right. Now, in this room, I love you. I love you sincerely, and I'm about to prove how much I love you. There are people who are still in the kingdom of darkness. You have not trusted Jesus. You do not know him as your king. Maybe you want to know him. Maybe you believe church going does it. Maybe you grew up Catholic and you believe religion will save you. Relationship. Understanding what Christ did for you and accepting it gets you out of darkness and into the kingdom of light. So I'm going to do one more thing before I explain how to do that for you who are still in the kingdom of darkness. If you believe you were healed this morning, stand up and lift your hands up. Stay standing. Stay standing. I want to say one more thing. Stay standing. Stay standing. Stay standing. Stay standing. I want to say one more thing before I finish up today. If you're here this morning, we could have put on a show for you. We could have talked to somebody beforehand about praying for them and tell them to say they were healed so there'd be a demonstration. I didn't talk to any of these people. But this is what I want you to know. You're not looking at one witness. You're looking at 75 to 100 people saying, the power of Jesus is real. So if you're here this morning, you just watched a demonstration of the power of the King. And I want you to hear me close. This King Jesus loves you madly, passionately and dearly so much so that scripture says we have all sinned we have all fallen short of the glory of God that's me and you what does that mean it means I have disobeyed God it means that I don't have enough glory in myself to stand before him whole and clean and righteous all have fallen short of that glory all have sinned here's the difference I recognized that I was not right with God. I recognized that all of my prayer, all of my church going, all of my Bible reading, all of my being a nice person was not going to be put on a scale and whichever came out the heaviest wins. How do I know that? Because Adam and Eve did one thing, one single disobedience. And what did God do? Sent them out of the garden. 
You're now following Satan. Go out there and deal with him. But God said, I will make a way for you to return to the kingdom. I will make a way for you to go from darkness into light. How is that? Jesus Christ. What did Jesus do? Jesus came in the form of man. That's you and me, just like you and I. And he lived out a life here for 33 years. And in that 33 years, he never sinned. He never disobeyed. He never disrespected God. He never did anything that would take him out of the kingdom of darkness, out of the kingdom of light, and put him into the kingdom of darkness. He who knew no sin became sin. What does that mean? It means I was due a consequence. I was due a punishment. I was due separation from God for eternity because I was following Satan. You know what Jesus did? He became sin on my behalf. He said, I will suffer the consequences that are due to you, Todd. I will take them on. I will be separated from God. Can you imagine Jesus Christ separated from his Father? He took on that death for you. He took it on for all of man. He said, I will die for their sin. So how do you claim that so you can come out of the kingdom of darkness and go into the kingdom of light? The Bible says we repent and we believe. What is repenting? Repenting is where I stop saying I've been a good person. I get to go to heaven. Repenting is where I say I'm not good enough on my own. Repenting is where I stop saying I go to church so surely I'm going to heaven. Repenting is when I change my mind and I say, I can't do this without Jesus. I'll never be righteous enough. I'll never be pure enough. I'll never be holy. I can't stand before God on my own merits. And believe. Believe what? Believe that when he went to that cross, you heard me say it a few minutes ago. Listen to me. This is critical. He was the only lamb uh, beaten before he was crucified. Why would he do that? Because he's taking on your physical affliction on the cross. He was a man of sorrows, the Bible said. Why did he take sorrows to the cross? Because he wants to take away your emotional pains, the hurts of your past. But most importantly, he died for your sin, for your consequence, for your punishment, for your condemnation. He took all that on himself so that you could be righteous. And all he's asking you to do is believe that he did that for you. If you would believe that he did that for you, not just for the world, but for you personally, that Jesus did that on the cross because he wanted Todd Mozingo out of the dark and into the kingdom of God. So he made a way and said, would you believe I did this for you? And I said, yes. Yes, I have tried over and over and over and over and over to be a good enough person. You can't do it. They could not accomplish the law in the Old Testament. You can't be good enough. But with Christ... Scripture says, I can now be hidden in Christ. What does that mean, hidden in Christ? It means God doesn't see my sins. He sees what Christ did for my sin. I stand before God, as you will one day, in one of two ways. One way, you'll be standing in front of God saying, but I was good. But I was a nice person. Look, everybody liked me. Everybody liked me. I slept with a few people, but everybody liked me. I, I, yeah, yeah, I stole something from a store once. But everybody liked me. Yeah, I got unrighteously angry. But everybody liked me. I was a really good person. And you'll be trying to convince God you're good. Or you'll stand in front of God, hopefully like I will, and say, I was never worthy of what Christ did for me. But right now, I'm pleading that his blood covered my sin. And I stand before you hoping to be hidden in Christ, not hoping, believing that I am hidden in Christ. Because your word said, if I would put my faith and trust in him, I could stand before you righteous. So I'm going to ask you right now to close your eyes. Not a preacher's trick. I just want you alone with you. What are you going to do when you stand before God? Are you going to try to convince him you're a good person? Or will you be able to say, I believe that Jesus Christ hung on a cross, bore the consequences of my sin and being separated from you, God, and that the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead, and now... In the kingdom of light, he has the power to give me light and life by transferring me out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And this morning, I want to repent for thinking I would ever be good enough on my own.
And I want to believe that I need Jesus and that Jesus did that for me. I believe that and I want to be transferred into the kingdom of light. And God is standing there saying, come, come to me. Come to me, I'll take you out of darkness. Come to me through Jesus. I'm just going to ask you this morning. The Bible says that all of heaven rejoices when one, one, one says, I want to be transferred out of darkness into light. And I just want to know if there's a party going on in heaven because right now you're saying to God, I repent and I believe in what Jesus did for me. And I want to be transferred out of Satan's world in the Christ world. If that's you, all eyes are closed. It's just you and me, and I'll explain that in a minute. I just want you to raise your hand if today you're saying, I'm going to be transferred. I see you, you, you. Who else? You, you. I see you. Praise God. See you. All right. Now, here's what the Bible says. That if you'll confess him, he'll confess you before the Father. I believe that anyone who is transformed, anyone who has gone from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light will confess him. You can't help it. You can't help it. you got the Holy Spirit in you now. The Holy Spirit has come and taken your dead, separated from God's spirit, and filled it so that it's been brought to life. Now you're operating as a new creation. How are you a new creation? Before you were body, soul, and a dead spirit in the kingdom of Satan. Now you are body, soul, and a live spirit with the Holy Spirit guiding you and directing you. You're a whole new ballgame. You're a whole new creation. Stand to your feet, please. This is how we're going to end today. Those of you who accepted Christ this morning, at the end of this prayer, I want you to come forward because I just want to bless you in your new walk. I want to bless you in your life. I want you to confess that you have gotten it this morning by coming down here and letting me just bless you and pray over your new walk. For everybody else, listen to me. If you're a believer, start reigning in Christ. If you're a believer, start reigning in this life. I'm going to be honest with you which sometimes is a real problem for me. Not that it's a problem being honest, but I be honest and then it creates problems. I didn't expect that many healings. Shame on me. Because God is good. Yeah. Father God, this morning we thank you that you are good, that you are a father, that you don't want to see us in pain. I thank you that you heal our bodies. I thank you that you take pain away. I thank you that we have locked it and sealed it and we are healthy. I thank you that we will not allow that enemy to have any door or any re-entrance to come back in. In the name of Jesus, we close those doors. And God, I thank you this morning that there are those in this place that just went from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. That you have regenerated their spirit, that you have washed them, that you have justified them, that you have made them whole. And you're going to begin walking with them and showing them what real peace is and what real joy is and what real life is. You're a loving father. Jesus, you're an excellent, perfect king. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your indwelling and your guidance. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day. Thank you for joining us today at Revive Us Now at our YouTube channel. Remember to click that subscribe button to Revive Church and share this video with a friend. And if you'd like to support this ministry, go to reviveusnow.com forward slash give.